Good afternoon, everyone. I, I want to begin by personally and on behalf of the Potter's Wheel Christian Fellowship offer our sincerest condolences to you, Marilyn, and to all the family and, and friends that are gathered here today. We're here today to celebrate the life of Charles Fitzpatrick Bond, or as many of you, us knew him, Charlie. We're here to celebrate the impact his life had on family and friends. Charlie was a man of faith, and he modeled the best qualities of all the roles in his life. This is the legacy that lives on in the lives of all those who had the honor of knowing him. Uh, <laughs> I've got to be careful not to make eye contact with my wife, uh, Jen. Uh, so I'm a board member here at the church, but um, Marilyn and Charlie were, well, are very close friends with my mom and dad. And um, when they came to the church about six years ago, uh, there was a connection there with, between my dad, and who was RCMP and also our pastor. Uh, and Charlie, the connection was made, and uh, it was always always a, a, a hug and that, and, and a warm hello. And uh, when my father retired and, and moved down east, um, Jen and I and our three boys kind of unofficially adopted uh, Charlie and Marilyn sort of as grandparents, so fill-ins. And uh, I know uh, my middle son, Declan, uh, who's here today in his... Um, cadet uniform. He wanted to honor Charlie that way, and uh, um, I'm uh, very honored that the family uh, accepted uh, to let him do so. And uh, Declan told me uh, just earlier this week that, you know, I'm going to miss the talks with Charlie, you know, because he's just fascinated with anything military. And he says, Charlie had so many stories, you know, and, says, and, and he's going to miss that. But all that to say that. Yes, we will miss him, but he has left his mark on, on each and every one who is here today. And he was such a, a, an important part of our church family. And so he will be missed. Um, so I'm going to open in prayer, and then we'll move into um, our program here today. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today to mourn the loss of a husband, father, grandfather, and many more accolades. We invite you to be in our midst to comfort both the family and friends gathered here today and those that are joining us virtually. We are so very grateful that your word declares that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And Father, we ask that you fill this place with your comfort today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this point, uh, John Evans will be coming up to do a scripture reading for us. So John. Isaiah 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 to 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God for all, of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. John 3, verse 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. At this point, I'd like to invite uh, the worship team to come up. We're going to have a song, It Is Well.
attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot now has taught me to say this time, I'd like to call up Chuck McCabe to come and share a few words. Uh, he served with Charlie. Very 
Jim. I'd like to extend the sympathies and condolence of our entire Blackwatch family, some of them who are here today, who have known Charlie for over 60 years. Sorry, my friend. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? <laughs> Uh, we have, sorry, again, I extend my, our condolences from the entire Black Watch family who have known Charlie for over 60 years. Uh, we met him first when he joined the Army in 1960 and was posted to the, uh, the Black Watch Depot in, in Gagetown, New Brunswick, and he was placed in 100 Squad. And at the time, he joined the Army with an, another person from here, Ross Bounsell, who was sitting just a few rows back and Bill Gilmore, Pipe Major Bill Gilmore, who can't be with us today. And they arrived in Gayson. The odd thing about that was, like me, most Blackwatch were Maritimers, and here we had three Ontario guys coming us. And I'm sure they had a bad time over that. <laughs> so the, uh, from, from, the, from the depot, and I, they graduated from depot in 1960, and we all went to, in 61 rather, and we all went to 2nd Battalion in Blackwatch, which was in Gayson at the time, but we went to Germany that year, uh, and spread into a few months of the 62, and stayed there until 1965, and we had a great time, and Charlie was popular wherever he was in the battalion. We went back to New, Brun back to New Brunswick and briefly in 1965, and then went over to uh, Cyprus, where Dave Harris, also here today, joined us, and I forget to mention Mike Kelly, who was with the second battalion in Germany as well. So we go back a few years. When we came back from Cyprus, we kind of lost track. But everyone, every, everyone went everywhere to the world. I think Charlie went to Montreal at that point in time, to St. Hubert. Uh, so everyone went their own way. But by 1982, we were all back here in Ottawa for some strange reason. I was at NDHQ. Ross was a teacher here in New Brunswick. Mike, you were here at the time. I'm not too sure where. And uh, Pipe Major Bill Gilmore was here as a Canadian Forces uh, Pipe Major. Uh, Charlie was posted to the Chaplain General's office here in Ottawa, where he worked with Padre John Farmer, who'd been our Padre in Germany back in, 19, in the early 60s. So we go back a long while. And we've seen Charlie, once Charlie and, and Marilyn moved here to Ottawa, we saw them at regular times over the, uh, over the years at, at social events. The most recent one was three weeks ago, where Charlie and Marilyn were both at our annual barbecue. Charlie looked fine. Everyone's had a good time. I, we were all shocked when, when uh, we got an email from Marilyn saying that he passed away. And it really was a shock to that, Marilyn. Charlie was well liked, liked and respected by every member of the Black Watch and right up until three weeks ago, and he still is, I should say. So again, many thanks for inviting us to share in the ceremony today. I'd like to, if the piper's gone, I guess, I'd like to say we've seen, listened to, to too many versions of the Flowers of the Forest recently, and uh, hope, hopefully there won't be that many more. So again, thank you, Marilyn, for inviting us here, and again, our sympathies. Thank you very much. At this point, we're going to have an audio um, message from Mary Ames, which is Charlie's sister. Hi, everyone. This is Mary, and I'm Charlie's sister, and this is my sister. Hi, everyone. This is Mary, and I'm Charlie's sister, and this is my salute to him. Charlie was the third of six children born to Leonard and Louise Bond in Bankley Hill, Ontario on August 27, 1942. Charlie left our family home so young at 17 years old to join the military and he was stationed at Camp Gagetown, New Brunswick. It must have been very lonely and difficult for such a young guy to be away from home doing the tough basic training required by the Canadian Forces. When he could, he came home for visits. I was so proud of my older brother in his uniform, serving in Canada's forces. We looked so forward to his short sojourns back at home. He spent many years with the military in Germany and then on a peacekeeping mission with the NATO troops in Cyprus. A few months ago, Charlie called my husband and I up and said, come to Florida and stay with us 
and we will do a couple of back-to-back -back cruises out of Miami with Cheryl Ann and Anthony. How could we refuse? So, okay, we booked that and had a good visit together. Unfortunately, before the end of the cruises, Charlie was unwell and the holiday came to an abrupt end. Charlie and Marilyn had to fly back to Gatineau only to find out he had had a heart attack while away. He never complained, never said he was sick or needed to get home. That was Chas, a trooper. Didn't want to spoil anyone's holiday. Charlie was always upbeat and eager to do things. I never saw him in a bad mood. We had several good times together in Daytona and Cape Coral over the years, exploring around, taking in sights, just having fun, listening to music. We had nice times at our homes in BC with family dinners, barbecues, exploring around the West Coast. Sometimes we were together with family in the Okanagan, where our Uncle Angus and Aunt Eileen hosted us so generously. Angus, also a veteran, was fearless and always up for fun, heading up mountains on motorcycles and what have you. Never a dull moment, and that was right up Charlie's alley. Charlie was an easygoing, sociable, very amiable guy, always ready for a friendly chat wherever he went or with whomever he met up with. He loved to be out on his motorcycle, especially on boys' trips, with his three brothers, his nephew, his son. Recently, when I suggested he might like to have a scooter to get around more easily, his quick reply was, No, I want a motorcycle. We both knew that wasn't happening. Chas was caring, kind, and thoughtful. He kept a close eye on her elderly mother, Louise, calling her every day to check on her. He was very good to her, taking him on trips with him and Marilyn over the years. Me, by our families, and so many others who knew him and loved him. Rest in peace in the arms of your Lord, Chas. Love you. Mary and Dave, Jennifer and Jason, Michael and Terry Lynn, Michaela, Braden, and Grayson. time, I'd like to call up uh, Bronwyn, Braden, and Cade Evans for a scripture reading, which will be followed by the song, Amazing Grace. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Proverbs 25, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, I'd just like to say a few words as well. So I remember when grandma and grandpa used to take care of us when we were younger. Well, mom and dad were on vacation. Naively, we thought it would be a vacation because mom and dad are away, so it's fair game to do anything, right? <laughs> but they weren't easy on us. <laughs> now, that's not to say we didn't have fun. And boy, we had a lot of fun. I can't even begin to count the good memories. There's way too many. But during those times when they took care of us, grandpa taught me the importance of respect. He used to stand on the front doorsteps waiting for me 20 minutes before a curfew. And he also used to say, if you're on time, you're late. <laughs> I also had quite a bad habit of not making my bed, to which Grandpa used to always say, if I couldn't bounce a nickel on my bed after making it, it wasn't done properly. A good lesson on attention to detail. I know some of these examples may seem minuscule, but I've carried these lessons and translated them to other areas of my life. Grandpa was a man of respect, honor, and kindness, and that is something I always and will continue to look up to. Thank you, Grandpa, for these lessons. I'll always think of you standing at the top of the stairs looking at your watch when I walk up the steps at home, whether I'm late or on time. Thank you.
Would you please stand with us as we sing Amazing Grace? My chains are gone. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. song and it's so fitting that Charlie's chains are gone and he is free today and we can take comfort in that 
At this time, I'd like to call up Anthony and Cheryl Ann Bond to share. Uh, we're going to read a message for them that they passed. Uh, oh, there we go. We're not actually Anthony and Cheryl Ann. Um, I'm Kurt. This is my wife, Bonnie. We're going to read a message that Anthony sent through. He wasn't able to be here and um, um, in person. Um, I'll also mention first that um, on your program, you saw David Bond, who's um, Charlie's youngest son. Um, he was going to send a video. We weren't able to get it um, in time for the service, but we will put it into the video that will be available um, after the service. So, so I'm going to read a note from Anthony now. Friends and family, I'd like to pass on a message from myself, uh, my wife, Cheryl Ann, and my children on the passing of my father. When I was a kid, which feels like yesterday, my dad was a hero. I looked up to him, admired him, and wanted to be like him. As I grew up and had a few gray hairs of my own, I came to understand that we are all human. We try our best to leave the world a better place for our kids, knowing that our time is here is short. It's a journey, and each of our journeys is different, and some are harder than others. While we mourn his passing, let us celebrate the love that he shared and the lives he touched. Remember him for the strength he demonstrated in the face of illness, for his unwavering determination to find happiness, and for the love he bestowed upon those around him. Let us celebrate his unwavering spirit and his ability to find joy and fulfillment in the bonds of family and faith. His legacy lives on. Rest in peace, Dad. You're still my hero. Your journey here may have come to an end, but your spirit will forever live on in the hearts of those who love you. May your memory forever be a source of comfort and inspiration to all who knew you. I love you. Your son, Anthony. At this time, I'd like to call up Tim and Kathleen Evans. Hi, everybody. I think some of you, um, this will be my second uh, public display of uh, crying in public. This one is online. If I can't find my glasses, this is going to be a really short speech. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to express uh, our sincere appreciation for everyone that's here and online. Your support and love for my dad and our family means the world to us. Sorry, this, is, this might take a while, so settle in. <laughs> my dad was a soldier. He was tough when he needed to be. It's okay, it's okay. But above, above all else, he was loyal and loving. He faced many challenges during his time with us, but the biggest battle of his life lasted just over 39 years. Dad waged war against health issues that threatened to take him away from us before he was ready. He overcame two open heart surgeries multiple bypasses, countless stents, numerous heart attacks and a stroke. He was taken to the brink several times, but each time he fought his way back to safety. We were all amazed by his resilience and tenacity. On one occasion when he was going into surgery and things were looking particularly grim, my dad told me to take care of my mother. I told my dad that I would, but I also said, you can take care of mom when you get out of the hospital. Sure enough, dad won that battle as well and was back home with mom in record time. His ability to overcome was inspirational. We started calling him the cat with nine lives. When we realized he must have had more than nine lives or used them up, Kat, <laughs> we, um, Kathleen renamed him the Energizer Bunny because he, was, he just kept going and going and going. So Kathleen bought this gift for, for Dad, and it sits by his computer. You might have heard the saying that you can't choose your family, 
but you can choose your friends. In my case, that actually wasn't completely true. You see, mom and dad were high school sweethearts, but had gone their separate ways after high school. When dad re-entered my mom's life, I distinctly remember the day he asked me if he could marry my mother. I was a young child and overwhelmed, but he genuinely wanted my approval and acceptance. He took a big risk in asking me, but even as a young child, it told me a lot about the type of person he was. It was the first of many lessons he taught me about being a man, and it was the beginning of a wonderful journey. I'm, we were blessed with an absolute treasure trove of rich memories of my dad. Summers at the cottage, hours in boats on Little Lake Bidibi, the Thousand Islands and Lake Ontario, weekend outings to the Plainsman Buffet, the Stony Creek Dairy, and Tim Hortons for donuts before anyone in Canada really knew what Tim Hortons was. Family trips to Daytona Beach, Myrtle Beach, Killington, Tromblas, Stowe, and later Fort Lobster Tail with Kathleen and the kids. And that's right, I said Fort Lobster Tail, not Fort Lauderdale. Dad got a kick out of saying Fort Lobster Tail to the grandkids over and over and over because it made them laugh. We took motorcycle trips to Montreal, Quebec City, and New York State. We then replaced the motorcycles with cruise ships and visited islands all over the Caribbean and then tried our hand at all-inclusives in Mexico. Dad relished these times with family. He prioritized being together and making memories. This was one of the other lessons he taught me. Put a priority on family. My dad was an adventurer, I think most of you know, with a bit of a mischievous streak. To give you a taste of what he was like, I'll share a couple of memories. I remember night skiing at Edelweiss, just outside Ottawa, when I was in high school. My friend and I were standing at the top of the hill when we noticed that the chairlift had stopped. After it was stopped for a few minutes, we watched as a guy slid off the chairlift and jumped down to the slope below. It was a big drop to the ground. It was definitely dangerous. Did you see what that guy just did, my friend asked? That maniac just jumped off the chairlift, he said. Moments later, the crazy guy skied up to us and stopped. It was my dad. (laughs) And yes, he could sometimes be crazy. (laughs) On another occasion, Dad asked me if I wanted to go for a motorcycle ride. I was younger then, so that meant riding on the back of his bike. He decided to take us on a road heading north out of Oakville, where we lived. He told me he needed to blow the carbon out of the bike so we'd need to max out the speed. We made it from Oakville to Milton in record time. I couldn't tell you how fast we were going, but I can tell you the needle was at the end of the speedometer. In hindsight, it probably wasn't the safest thing to do, but it was definitely fun. That was another lesson he taught me, not speeding, but the lesson was it's important to work hard, but you have to have fun along the way. The last night I had with my dad was short, but very special. Before I arrived in Gatineau, my mom told me the doctors had said that dad only had a short time left. I anticipated that it would be a somber time together. When I arrived, it was completely different. He was the energizer bunny. Dad was animated, talkative, and engaged. He wanted to talk about the grandkids. He asked about Kathleen, and he was excited to see Sebastian who's Bronwyn's husband, in his pilot's uniform. See, Sebastian had just flown his first flight that day as a captain for Air Canada Jazz. Dad couldn't have been more thrilled (laughs) for Sebastian. He didn't want to talk about himself, other than to say that he was at peace with what was, was to come. Right until the end, he was thinking about the people around him. That was his final lesson for me. Put your focus on the people you love. I'd like to end by reading a poem by Ellen Brenneman called His Journey Has Just Begun. Don't think of him as gone away. His journey's just begun. Life holds so many facets. The earth is only one. Just think of him as resting from the sorrows and the tears in a place of warmth and comfort where there are no days and years. Think how he must be wishing 
that we could know today how nothing but our sadness can really pass away. And think of him as living in the hearts of those he touched. For nothing loved is ever lost, and he was loved so much. (laughs) Dad, you showed us how to love, laugh, and live well. Giving your approval to marry my mother was one of the best decisions I've ever made. We will all miss you very dearly, but we know that you are getting things, you're going to be getting things organized for us up in heaven on the other side. We love you, Dad. At this time, I'd like to call Kurt and Bonnie uh, back up. In hindsight, I probably should have put myself before my brother. (laughs) Uh, If I can't make it, Bonnie's going to take over. (laughs) Um, Thank you, everyone, for your support during this time for my mom and our whole family. Um, We highly value each one of you and um, just wanted to say that, um, to acknowledge that. Seeing everyone here and hearing what has been shared beautifully describes the significant impact my dad had in his lifetime. He touched the hearts of everyone he met, and he built truly genuine relationships with each person. I fully realized this when my friends would make a point to visit him, even when I wasn't with them. My dad and I came to share many common interests as I grew up, and I was his little helper a lot of the time. He taught me some of his woodworking skills, how to use the big tools, though I never achieved his skill level. He taught me how to drive a boat. Tim talked at our cottage during the years, and uh, he's probably to blame for my passion for cars and having owned far too many cars. We both shared a love for chicken wings, which we went out for countless times over the years, and our most serious conversations were actually had over, over wings. But of course, His love of motorcycles became our top shared interest. He was determined to stay on two wheels as long as he possibly could, no matter the odds. We put a lot of seat time on our bikes together and we created many, many memories. When you were with him, no matter what you were doing, it was quality time. We all have endless great stories about Dad, our times with him and how much he impacted each of our lives. As sad as we are that he's not with us anymore, it's next to impossible not to have a smile on our faces when we think about him. Charlie Bond was an amazing son, a brother, a soldier, a husband, a dad, a grandfather, and a friend. He modeled the best qualities of each of these roles. I certainly hope I can model this to my family and friends as well as he did. He was the strongest man I knew and a huge fighter. Dad was always in good spirits right to the very end and was more concerned with the rest of us than he was for himself. Dad was a man of faith and now he is seeing what he believed in, living in glory. He has received perfect healing. We take comfort in knowing he is enjoying everlasting life with his heavenly father. I love you, Dad. We'll see you soon. Thank you. At this time, um, my mom and dad have made a video, so we're going to be playing that, and it's from Pastor Andy and Sandy Bigra. Sandy and I would like to offer our sincere condolences to you, Marlon, and to your family at the passing of Charlie. Uh, we know he'll be missed. We, I remember the first couple times he came to church. Uh, and one Sunday he had mentioned that, Andy, you're the first pastor that ever shook my hand, and it means a lot to me. 
and that was the beginning of a friendship. And uh, we'd go to lunch together. We'd uh, meet each other at each other's houses on occasion, and we'd uh, we'd we'd uh, we became friends. And even when we moved to Moncton, we continued our friendship through FaceTime. Every now and then, we'd get together and get caught up on what was taking place. Uh, I know that uh, Charlie had a heart for the poor. He uh, was a, a man that uh, really taught a lot of those that were less fortunate. And at one time, he encouraged the church, uh, approached me and encouraged the church that we should raise the, the money necessary for Cuba to buy that uh, piece of property or to put the second story on their home to have their church. So I know that Charlie uh, took took his uh, responsibilities seriously and he always had a smile, was always happy, was always an encourager. And uh, we know that uh, we're gonna miss him so we can imagine how the family feels about it. So we just wanna, wanted to share that with you today because he meant so much to us. And uh, so we'll just ask uh, the Lord to uh, guide you and lead you through this uh, morning process and Sandy and I will keep you in our prayers. And we just want to let you know that uh, we love you and, and we care for each and every one of you. God bless. At this point, I'd like to invite Pastor Fidel Bolton to come and share the word with us. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Pastor Fidel Borton, as you've heard. Um, I feel honored to be here. It's only a few months that I did this for my own mother in Rwanda. So um, I feel privileged to have known Marlene and Charlie only for a short time, but in our hearts, we, we felt like we knew each other for a long time. Before I just came back from Africa, I do missions, preaching the gospel, and before I left a um, month ago, Charlie held my hand, and he said, good job. He looked so proud of me. So what I'm going to share with you is what I believe he would want me to say. And um, try to imagine as if it's him here talking to you. Today I'm talking to you about safety of the dead. He is a God of the living. For to him, all are alive. So he, Charlie, loved fun. So we're going to sing. Is that OK? <laughs> OK. So here we go. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roar is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roar is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection they will share. When the chosen of earth shall gather over on the other side, and the roar is called up yonder, will you be there? That's how he will want me to ask you. 
I will read for you First Thessalonians verse um, 13 in the fourth chapter. It says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's words, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not proceed, uh, proceed those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. These are wonderful words. I have um, three statements to make, hopefully, uh, by the help of God, they can encourage us. Number one, the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides eternal safety for those who are found in his arms. Isn't that good news? The resurrection of Jesus Christ provides eternal safety for those who are found in his arms. There are two problems that a human being can have. You know, not having enough money is a problem, but not as big as this one. The first one is not realizing that your soul might not be safe. I'm talking about eternal safety. The second problem is realizing that your soul may not be safe, but seeking the safety where that safety cannot be found. I have a message that is only through the glorious resurrection of Jesus that souls can find safety in the way that is everlasting. People go through life and they have, we have um, things that God wired in, in us that cause us not to be at peace. So everyone has this feeling that we are not at home. Whether we admit it or not. I come from Rwanda. I seen it with my own eyes how many people can die in a short time. That made me wonder, are these people really dying? Or there is some kind of harvesting going on? So people we have in our souls that sense that this is not our home. And I'm here to show you, to tell you that we need to be sure that our souls are safe. Your body may be safe, but you need also to be sure that your soul is eternally safe. People realize that, realize that their souls may not be safe, and then they start to look for safety in the wrong places. Fame, money, religion. But today, I feel like Charlie will want me to tell you that safety is only found in the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You can say amen. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> that's number one, safety. Is your soul safe? Number two is rest. This world is full of weariness. People are tired. I lived half of my life in a place where food was not you know, enough. 
So I tell people now that there is weariness with money and there is weariness without money. You can have rest for your body, yet your heart is restless. And that is nothing compared to the restlessness that souls go to when they die outside of Jesus Christ. There is a Sabbath, eternal Sabbath, that has been provided for by God himself. And it's free. So if there is something you can do for Charlie today, is to meet him in this eternal rest when we all go. I wrote some words, let me read for them for you. And that is um, about this rest. One day Jesus told people, and they were, even to this day, it's a little difficult to understand. He said, I am the resurrection. It's not that I resurrect people. I am the resurrection. So this resurrection in him, we meet eternal moment that is presented to all creatures. When we meet this glorious resurrection, we hear his voice knocking. It says, come. Come to me. He stands eternally immovable and stable, yet he wears a human body as one of us. In his hands, we see an invitation and a promise of rest. So, our hearts have ears and have eyes. Everyone here, there will be no excuse. You have to forgive me. I feel like he will want me to say this. We don't know how many opportunities people get. And when we appear in heaven, on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. That day, Charlie will be there. Hallelujah. So, uh, whenever the gospel is preached, Christ presents himself to the heart and opens the door to his dwelling place, his eternal day, and encourages us to enter by faith. To those who say yes, Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, becomes our rest that very moment. By hope we enter, his peace becomes our rest. His stability becomes our home. In finishing, when I was in Rwanda doing the funeral of my mother, there was a lot of us, maybe 300 people. And I told them, I said, you know, there are rumors that are circulating here that my mother is dead. Do not believe it. <laughs> Amen. Not even for a second. Something has happened to her, but she lives. Hallelujah. So I want to say to you that you will hear that Charles Fitzpatrick Bond, Bond was born August 27, 1942. That belief. But you will hear also that he died June 21st, 2023. Do not believe it. Amen? Because his soul is eternally safe. In Luke 20, 20, 38, Jesus said, God is the God of Abraham, of Moses, and Isaac and Jacob, and these people are dead a long time ago. And he said to them, no, he is not a God of the dead. He is a God of the living, for to him all are alive. So Charles is alive because his soul is safe, 
because he entered his eternal Sabbath and because he's in the arms of the God of the living. God bless you. So at this point, we're going to have another song, Just As I Am. Would you stand with us, please? As we come to the end of our service today, I just want to um, invite each and every one of you to join us downstairs. We have a light luncheon that has been prepared for you. Uh, we, and so after uh, the end of the service, we'll just ask for a few minutes for us to set up. And then um, as you go downstairs, we'll have you go down from the back and come back up through the stairs here on the side. And you can... Uh, remain in the sanctuary as long as you want uh, to share more of those very precious memories of Charlie, and we encourage you to do that. So just before the closing prayer, I'd like to share a little poem, and this is one I've, I've heard my father use over the years. 
and it's called The Dash Between the Years, and I'm sure some of you have already heard this, but that dash between the years represents a whole lifetime. I read in the paper a notice of the passing of a friend. I took note of his date of birth and the date that marked the end. I realized as I read those lines and my eyes filled up with tears, it wasn't the dates that meant so much. It was the dash between the years. That little dash represents the time Charlie spent here on earth. And only those who loved him know what that little dash is worth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together to reminisce and to celebrate the life of Charlie. We thank you for his life. We thank you for the heritage and the legacy that he leaves behind in his children, his grandchildren, and anyone who knew him. Let us leave here today with the memories of a man who lived life to the fullest and recognized what a true legacy is, and that is a life of faith lived in service of you, his Savior and King. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want to come up?
Are you part of the uh, I'm really close to Kurt. Uh, yeah, Charlie's son. So, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I sometimes play. Wonderful. That's great. I'm glad you do.